Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of The Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are going to do a little bit of genealogy methodology. Specifically, we are going to talk about negative evidence. Now, this might be a brand new concept to some of you, so I'm just going to spend a few minutes reviewing some elements of the genealogical proof standard. Then I will talk about the different kinds of evidence, and then specifically about negative evidence. We'll then talk about a case study that I did, um, some research that I did where negative evidence helped to prove the case. And I won't share all of the details or specifics about that. I want to keep this really high level so that you can think about concepts more than the specifics so that you can more readily apply that to your own family history research. And then we'll wrap up with just some resources where you can go to um, read some specific case studies, uh, look at some specific examples um, of negative evidence helping to prove a genealogical research question. So let's go ahead and dive in with a little bit of an introduction for some of you or a review for the rest of you about the genealogical proof standard. So the first element of the genealogical proof standard is a reasonably exhaustive search. And it, during a reasonably exhaustive search, what we're doing is we are uncovering sources which contain information pertaining to the research question. So what that presumes is that we have a specific research question that we are trying to answer. Who are the parents of John Smith born in 1850 in Pennsylvania? Um, or you know, who are the children of this particular couple? Or where was this individual born? Or where did he die? Okay, so we have a specific research question that we've formulated, and then we do a reasonably exhaustive search, looking in all of the available records to um, uncover sources. Now, sources are just a container for information. So we're looking at actually the information contained in those sources. Then we take all of that information that we've collected during that reasonably exhaustive search, we analyze it, we correlate it, we make sure that we resolve conflicting um, information, and all of that leads us to evidence. Types of evidence include direct evidence, where the question that we asked is um, answered by the information we've uncovered, indirect evidence and negative evidence. So let me just review some of these, some information about these three types of evidence. Direct evidence means it directly answers the research question. If I asked, you know, when was um, John Smith born, and I find a census record that tells me how old he is, that is direct evidence. Now that evidence may not be complete, right, because it just gives me a general year, uh, not a specific date in the census. It might also not even be accurate, right? If I ask who are the parents of John Smith and I find a death certificate that lists his parents as Thomas Smith and Mary Williams, Mary Williams may not be his mother, right? So, I, so direct evidence directly answers the research question, but we need to keep in mind that it might not be complete and it might not be accurate, which is why other types of evidence are sometimes needed. Indirect evidence may support or weaken the direct evidence. So, for example, I'm looking for the parents of John Smith. His death certificate states directly that his parents are Thomas Smith and Mary Williams. But I have a death certificate for his older brother and a birth and death certificate for his younger sister, and their parents are listed as Thomas Smith and Mary Jones. Okay, so what's happened now is I have indirect evidence, an older sibling and a younger sibling, who have a different mother's name listed, and that weakens the direct evidence that I have on, my, on the death certificate for my person that states who his mother is directly. Okay, so that's, what it, that's how direct evidence and indirect evidence can work together. It's also one of the reasons why it is so very important that when we do family history research, we research families in their entirety. That's why it's called family history research that we're researching entire families, not just singular individuals, because those patterns 
of information that we collect in families oftentimes leads us to truth faster, easier, more accurately than the direct evidence that we can sometimes uncover. So indirect evidence could support the direct evidence or it could weaken the direct evidence. And one of the reasons we use indirect evidence is to look for patterns and connections, um, look for, you know, as we analyze and correlate that information that we've collected, sometimes we can see things in those records that others might have missed because they were only looking at one record or because they were only looking at three out of the ten that we're looking at or because they didn't have the information that we have about the laws governing the creation of that record at a specific time and place. So understanding these two types of evidence is really critical to lead us up to negative evidence. And the easiest way to explain negative evidence is just to ask the question, what should be there but isn't? Um, and we'll go over some examples of this, but I want you to start wrapping your head around this idea of um, blank space means something. Uh, Elizabeth Schoen Mills uses the example um, of Sherlock Holmes and his famous um, statement about the dog not barking. The dog not barking means something. And so we have to keep that in mind as we look for um, information in the sources that we're using for our family history. We have to see what's missing, which means sometimes we have to be familiar enough with the records to know what is missing. We need to have looked at enough of them, not just the specific records for our family, but sometimes it means we have to look at all of the marriage records in a particular county for a 10-year time span, or we have to sit in the courthouse and review all of the property records for that particular location, or we have to understand the law about land ownership in a specific state at a specific time. Okay, so, so negative evidence is what should be there but isn't. Here's how Elizabeth Schoen Mills actually states it. In her book, Evidence Explained, she says inference, uh, negative evidence is inference we can draw from the absence of information that should exist under particular circumstances. If you do not yet have a copy of Evidence Explained, I would strongly encourage you to uh, get a copy of that. You can have a hard copy or an electronic copy. Uh, mine sits on my desk and I use it constantly but um, it's a really good refresher or reminder about some of the things we might be missing as we uh, do our family history research. So here are just some examples. There are a multitude of them, but here are just a few examples of negative evidence. When you are looking for um, a child that you think belongs with a specific family and that child is not listed with the family on a census record, that is negative evidence. Right? Something that you expect to be there, a five or six or seven year old child living with his family, not listed on the census. Now there could be reasons for that. That child could have been away at school. That child could have been staying with grandparents or aunts or uncles because mom just had a new baby. Um, the family may not have provided the census taker with the information. It could have been the next door neighbor and he could have completely forgotten about that child. But um, on its surface without, you know, and of course we're going to, to combine this with direct and indirect evidence. Negative evidence is not going to stand on its own, but on the surface, a young child not listed with a family on a census record could be an indication that that child does not belong with that particular family, that those are not the parents that you thought you were looking for. So uh, that is one example. Another example, um, a living individual not named in the will or obituary of a supposed parent where all other children are listed. So if you think you've identified the parents of an individual, even if you have a direct piece of evidence that says these are the parents, and then you find a will and or an obituary for that parent, and all their other children are listed but this person is not, that may be evidence that that person is not actually their child. So that's something that you expect to be there that is not there. Uh, similarly, if you have a surviving spouse who is not listed in an obituary or a will, that could be negative evidence of a divorce 
or um, a separation. So yes, the both people are still living. Yes, they were married at one time. You may have, um, you may have evidence of that in a multitude of places. But if that surviving spouse is not listed in an obituary or a will, that could be negative evidence of a divorce or a separation. So again, what's not there that you expect to be there. A, sing a final singular example um, is you've been told your whole life that your you know, grandfather was born in a specific place and you're trying to identify his parents and rather than just search for your grandfather or rather than search for the names of his parents, one of the um, reasonably exhaustive search methodologies is to do a search in a specific county during a specific time frame for everybody with a particular surname. And just to get an idea of who the families are that could possibly be the parents. Well, if you've looked in that location and there is no family with that surname or any of the spelling derivatives of that surname, it could be that the information that you have about where he's from is inaccurate. Again, even if the information you have is direct, it might not be correct. And so as we do these reasonably exhaustive searches, sometimes we have to think a little bit outside of the box, um, that we some, outside of the search box is what I, what I often say, um, and try to craft searches or um, research strategies that allow you to identify information that might not be there. It sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but it is a wonderful research strategy uh, to help us uncover information that we might miss if we just take one piece of um, information in one source and claim that as the so, sum total of our evidence uh, to answer a specific research question. This is why a reasonably exhaustive search is the first step of the genealogical proof standard because um, just because we found a record that answers our research question does not mean it's right. So. Um, here are some examples of negative evidence. I could have listed 10 or 20 more, but my purpose today is just to introduce you to this topic to get you thinking about uh, how this might apply to your particular research problems. So I'm gonna use a specific case study. This is a research problem that I worked on this last month. Um, so the information that we are looking for, the research question that we devised was, who are the parents? Um, of Hugh Golly, who was born 12th of May, 1825 in Oneida County, New York. Now we know his birth date and place because we've, I, we've located um, a lot of other sources. So we have census records, we have a death certificate, we have, a, we have burial records, we have an obituary, we have the birth um, and death records of several of his children. We have um, a family history that was written. We have, like there is, there is a lot of information about this individual. He ended up moving out west um, shortly after he married and all of his children were born out west. There was never any other family member who appeared to be living in any proximity to him. So um, he was uh, married and moved away from his family and started this new life and there is no indication at all in family records or otherwise that he had any contact with his family back in New York. Now he could have, I mean they could have written letters, they could have visited, but nobody ever moved out west with him. There's no indication of that. And the reason we know that is because when we find him in census records, starting with the 1850 census in Iowa, when we find him in census records, we have searched those county, that county and surrounding counties where he has lived from 1850 on for other people with the same last name. We've even gone so far as to look at other people living in those locations who were born in New York. The reason we did that is because maybe he had a sister and maybe she married someone else with a different last name and maybe she was living right next door to him and we didn't even recognize it, right? So you, your reasonably exhaustive search sometimes needs to include, um, you know, everybody in that same town or everybody, you know, who has a unique identifying feature like living in Iowa, born in New York, um, in the same age range enough to be a sibling. And keep in mind that as sisters or 
marry or as mothers remarry that they're going to have a different last name and so we collected all of this information so that we could look for patterns um, that's that indirect evidence concept so that we could start to see if any of these same people as he moved from census to census uh, ended up still living near him groups of people that m migrate together from state to state or even from county to county sometimes are related particularly if they're from the same place of origin and it's further it's further away than you know the next county over so in this case we have an individual from new york living in iowa we collected names and information of people who were living around him as he moved from census to census and we were not able to find any patterns but consistently the information we found led us to the conclusion of his birth date and place and it also informed us consistently that both his parents were born in Ireland. So we had that piece of information to work with. Now we did look at published family histories. That means um, published as in like books, right? There were several family histories published of groups of, fam you know, groups of people that included information about him. There are also several published family histories, meaning online trees. Um, in various locations that we looked at. And all of those published family histories, <coughs> excuse me, while they provide direct evidence, direct information regarding his parentage, which is the research question we asked, they conflicted. Now, I would give you a word of caution that even if they didn't conflict, even if every single published family history we looked at in a book, in an online tree listed the same parents, we would still need to prove that, okay? Um, and so we would still be looking for additional evidence in our reasonably exhaustive search that proves whatever somebody said um, about his parents. But in this case, it conflicted, which gave us an immediate red flag that we needed to gather additional evidence. So um, we started looking, okay? Now keep in mind, he was born in 1825. So the first census that he appears in listed by name um, is the 1850 census. So he got married in the 1840s um, and started having a family uh, and moved out west. But uh, prior to 1850 here in the United States, the only person listed on the census was the head of household. And then there are just tick marks for individuals who are of a particular age. So Hugh should be a tick mark in the 1830 and 1840 census. Well, um, we looked in the 1830 census and the 1840 census in Oneida County and surrounding counties, because you never know if your person may have lived on the border of a county um, and may have been enumerated in a separate county, or maybe they moved back and forth between counties. So just because somebody was born in a county doesn't mean they stayed there, obviously. Um, so we checked Oneida and surrounding counties for the 1830 and 1840 census, and we collected a bunch of names and started researching these particular individuals. Now, um, in the 1830 and 1840 census, there were three men listed who had a male child who would have been born in about 1825. So we were working with um, three particular individuals that we had identified as possible candidates to be the parent of our, um, of Hugh. Well, as we did further research on these three individuals and the other people of that same name in the area, what we realized is that it was all one family. We found a published family history um, that had quite a bit of detail, and it was written by one of the grandchildren of this, in this particular family um, that stated that there were six children in this family. Some of them were girls, so they had different last names, but several of them were men. And they immigrated from Ireland, so that was consistent with the information we had found earlier. Um, and they had come with their widowed mother. So when their father had passed away, um, several of them wanted to come to America, and their mother stated that she would come, but only if all six of her children came. And so all six of her grown children immigrated from Ireland to New York with their widowed mother and uh, 
are identifiable by these families that we located in the 1830 and 1840 censuses. We looked at property records, um, we looked at um, obituaries, we looked at death records, and we were able to account for all six of these children. And that still uh, left us with these three brothers in this family that were candidates to be the father of Hugh. So then, how do we narrow down which one of these men is his father? Well, when we went back to our published family histories, we realized that two of the men that we had identified um, were, uh, were included. So two of the men we had identified were the two men that the conflicting evidence suggested might be his father. So we felt fairly confident that we were on the right track as we were gathering um, information from all of our sources um, and you know as we were analyzing that information. So we started to do research into each one of these three men um, extensively, right, reasonably exhaustive search. And what we uncovered is that one of the brothers had a son named Hugh. And we got all excited and we thought, this is it. And then we realized that he, in every record we found for this Hugh, he was 10 years younger than our Hugh and he was living in an entirely different place with a different wife and a different family. Um, and of course there's the temptation to say, well, maybe he was a bigamist and maybe he had two separate families and maybe he lied about his age so that he couldn't be identified as the same person. But um, the more we talked about that and the more we looked at the evidence and analyzed what we'd collected, um, the more ridiculous that sounded. So we realized that this was actually a different um, hue and he is the cousin, we, we assumed, based on the information we'd collected, of our Hugh. And it was highly unlikely, given the time and the traditions of, of this particular group of people, that they would have two sons with the same name. Now, I mention that because sometimes families do have children um, with the same name, even children who are still living. Now I know um, in, Engl in England and in some other uh, regions of the world, sometimes when a child dies, um, a family will rename, reuse that name with a subsequent child. So you will have children with the same name sometimes in a family, but usually it's because a previous child had died. But there are instances, and I have them in my own family, where <clears throat> a child will be named after someone or in honor of someone and then a subsequent child will be given the same name in honor of someone else with that name and sometimes they would call them by a nickname and sometimes they you know would call them by a shortened version of their name sometimes what we look at as the same name isn't I have families where there is a John and a Jonathan um, you know and they called them John and Jonathan um, and so you just have to you have to check your assumptions because what you think may be true may not be true. So we went through the whole thing to analyze this individual and we came to the conclusion that they were in fact two separate individuals and that the family did not have another son named Hugh. So that ruled out one of the brothers. The second brother we looked at, um, we traced him again all the way through his life to his death. We looked at property records, we looked at probate records, um, we looked at uh, we found an obituary, we found, I mean, we found all sorts of records about this individual. And in his will, specifically, he names all of his children, including the deceased children, as he leaves property to their children. Um, and so all the children, all of his children appear to be accounted for, and we compared that with the census records that we found, and we traced each of those children so that we knew how old each of them were so that we could match it up with those 1830 and 1840 census records. And at the conclusion we came to, right, what's missing? What is, what's not there that would, we would expect to be there? Well, there was no hue. <laughs> so, um, so again, this negative evidence, what's missing, helps us come to a conclusion that this is not the father. Well, we had only identified three men. We've now eliminated two. And interestingly enough, and probably the reason for the confusion about his parentage, um, is that this third brother uh, died early and left no evidence anywhere of the names of his children. So there were no um, 
There was, there was no probate record that we were able to locate. There were no property records that gave us any indication of the names of his children. His wife's uh, information was, didn't, his wife didn't yield us any additional information as far as obituaries or wills or property. Um, we, I mean, we searched and searched and searched. We even researched the other children. Um, we actually were able to identify a couple of their children. We researched them to see if they left any indication of the names of their surviving siblings or, um, you know, if any of them went west to live near where our Hugh was living. I mean, just, it, it was a reasonably exhaustive search. But um, as far as we can tell, with all the research that we've done, these are the only three candidates um, in the right time, in the right place, with the right other matching up information to be the father of Hugh, and we had definitively proven that two of them were not. And so that led us to the conclusion that brother number three is the father of Hugh. And um, the evidence that we were able to uncover about his wife and their marriage leads us to believe that she was Hugh's mother. So. Sometimes, you know, death certificates, birth certificates, those things are fairly modern constructs. And so, you know, we're not going to find a birth certificate in 1825 that definitively lists the parents of Hugh, you know, born in, born in New York that year. Uh, it, it just doesn't exist. Such a thing wasn't ever even created. Um, and sometimes records were not created, and sometimes they were created and they don't survive. And so we have to look at other evidence. And sometimes it requires um, a lot of research. Sometimes it requires looking at direct evidence and indirect evidence and negative evidence in concert with each other to come to a particular conclusion. But if we hadn't done that research, it would have been really easy to say, oh, well, this hue is our hue, and therefore, right? And then we would have had the wrong parents, and we would have, would have had an extra wife instead of kids that didn't belong to him. Or, you know, and then as you start researching um, that wife and that mother, now you're climbing somebody else's family tree instead of your own. Uh, it would have been easy to come to the conclusion that this brother, brother number two, was his father. He was listed on several family trees as the father. Again, we would have ended up climbing someone else's family tree if we had assigned him to that man and his wife. So, um, so for me, one of the reasons why this process is so important is not just because I'm interested in the truth, it's also because I want to make sure that I'm honoring my ancestors with accuracy. I also want to make sure that I'm climbing my own family tree, that I haven't plugged in the wrong set of parents or the wrong mother, or, you know, um, because then I will end up doing a whole bunch of research that is not pertinent to me and to my ancestry. Well, here, um, in conclusion, let me just share with you a few places where you can go to read up more on this. I know some of you, um, a lot of you that come and watch these videos every week, um, I appreciate you so much, all of you, but um, some of you, video-based learning is not the best way for you to learn, and I understand that, and so I just wanted to provide you with some additional or alternative learning opportunities. First, I mentioned um, Elizabeth Schoen Mills and her book, Evidence Explained. She has a companion website. It's evidenceexplained.com, and it is a really, really useful resource. And Quick Lesson 13 on her website uh, is about classes of evidence, and she actually goes over the very things that we talked about, that direct, indirect, and negative evidence. And she uses a specific case study with some great examples um, where she, uh, negative evidence was used, well actually where all three classes of evidence were used um, to prove the, um, it's about the Thomas Jefferson Sally Hemings case and specifically whether or not Thomas Woodson was Sally Hemings' child. And it's a fascinating read, so if you want to head on over to that website and check that out, I would encourage you to do so. Um, the Board for Certification of Genealogists, bcgcertification.org is their website. They have a Becoming Certified FAQ, and question number 10 specifically deals with negative evidence, so that's some great reading. Um, offline, there are some resources available to you if you are interested. Uh, while you're on that BCG website, they have a newsletter called On Board. It's $15 a year to receive that newsletter. And there was recently an article there by Stephanie Evans, who is a CG. It's called Embrace the Negative, uh, Recognizing and Applying Negative Evidence. And she does, she does a great job 
um, reviewing neg negative evidence and providing some concrete examples there. And then finally, and this is where I spend a lot of my um, personal genealogy study time, the National Genealogical Society provides its members with a quarterly magazine uh, where scholarly articles are written about genealogical discoveries, and they do a great job um, just providing you with really specific examples that you can study and lots of information about the sources that they used and complete source citations, and it's just a fascinating study. And sometimes it's even fun to take one of those case studies and follow it through and like redo the research and see if you come to the same conclusions. And if you don't, then go back and re-study re it and see what you might have missed. It only enhances your skills as a genealogist, and the more you enhance your skills as a genealogist, I'm convinced the more fun you have doing genealogy, and of course, the more accurate your family history is. That's all I have for you today. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.